So welcome, Clark. Thank you. Well, yeah, it's it's been 25 years uh, as of the new year. So uh, yeah, I'm one of those old gray haired guys that uh, I think I can officially call myself an old gray haired guy now. Um, we'll be talking about herbicide resistance today and essentially um, can we keep doing what we're doing and and avoid um, a, a catastrophe as far as herbicide resistance goes. Um, what we'll start with is is a definition of what uh, resistance is versus uh, tolerance. And so herbicide tolerance is something that's always been there. Uh, the plant never was controlled by the particular herbicide and it won't be in the future. Whereas herbicide resistance is a little bit different in that the plant used to be controlled, but it's not anymore. And there's uh, different types of uh, herbicide resistance that are out there. Uh, the most common type that we find in Saskatchewan is the target site or single gene mutation. Um, and that's essentially just a mutation of uh, a gene that is either the target site itself or uh, a gene that's associated with the target site. And that per prevents the, the herbicide from associating with that target site. In a non-target site type resistance, uh, generally these are multigenic. And so what has to happen is that we have to have several mutations line up uh, throughout the plant in order for uh, that resistance to occur. And so that can um, that can be a, a case like uh, the auxin mimics where auxins impact a variety of different sites throughout the plant. And so affecting any one of those doesn't really compromise the plant a whole lot. Whereas uh, if you impact a whole bunch of sites all together, then you'll have a bigger impact on, on the, the plant. And so that plant would have to modify each one of those sites in order to become resistant. Or it's a change in the way that the, the, the herbicide behaves within the plant. And again, that would require uh, multiple uh, gene mutations. So this is our, our common uh, system that we've got, which is our uh, target site system. And essentially we're looking at the target en enzyme in the plant. And essentially it's, uh, it's the equivalent of a catalyst. And you've got material going into that site being transformed and moving out again. In that case, the green material was essential, some essential material that was uh, um, important for the growth of the plant. And the other two were, uh, potentially components coming into that site in order to create that essential component for growth. If we get into uh, uh, herbicide uh, interacting with that site, it locks into that site and uh, does not uh, come off of that site. So what it does is it prevents those elements from uh, entering the site and then producing the uh, essential component for growth. And uh, the herbicides that we would look at with respect to that would be oftentimes some of the herbicides that we refer to as systemic type herbicides or um, essentially I would refer to them as growth component inhibiting and those are the ones that um, essentially modify the growth of that plant somehow. So that's all the groups that we have sitting there as far as resistance groups. The other thing that can happen is that as a part of that process you get some kind of toxic element backing up within the system and creating a membrane disrupting type effect and so uh, we've got our groups on the left there that would um, would relate to that that kind of activity within the plant and one thing to note is that there is one group that kind of does the same thing um, group 10 or uh, glufosinate is a glutamine synthase inhibitor. So it prevents the production of, of uh, essential components for growth in, the, in that uh, glutamine pathway. And then it also backs up ammonia within the cell that uh, attacks the cells, the cell uh, membranes. In a resistance site, essentially what you get is a little bit of a modification in where that herbicide fits into that site. Now the herbicide can't fit into the site and so the reaction takes place normally. 
and that goes on and on in the plant until you get to a point where the the herbicide is beginning to break down and disappearing from that that site and the the plant survives quite nicely and continues to grow and reproduce is the key um a little bit different is the way that um some plants uh, develop resistance and a good example of that is is uh, glyphosate resistant kochia the the target site um, within this type of resistance is still susceptible to the herbicide but what happens is that normally within the plant you may have one maybe two uh, locations for that uh, the coating for that EPSPS enzyme within the plant and it produces a set amount of that that enzyme within the plant and we apply our glyphosate to the plant and we essentially have an excess of glyphosate relative to that EPSPS enzyme and it results in the death of the plant. But what we get with resistance to glyphosate in kochia is that that, uh, that gene reproduces itself through the uh, the genome of the of the the, uh, the plant and we get an overproduction of the EPSPS enzyme. We put in the same amount of glyphosate that we put in in the last slide and essentially we end up with extra EPSPS enzyme left over and as a result um, the plant continues to function normally. In the initial phases you may find that that plant is maybe not quite as uh, aggressive as it might have been um, as a normally susceptible plant without the glyphosate, uh, but the more of an excess you get in that uh, EPSPS enzyme, um, the more hardy that plant gets and it, uh, it tends to act normally relative to uh, the susceptible without herbicide. Other non-target site mechanisms, and oftentimes we find these with respect to glyphosate resistance, is that we end up getting, say, a, a multi-gene mutation in just the exactly right spot uh, that allows that, uh, that plant to resist glyphosate. Uh, and that's a very low odds venture there. Uh, oftentimes we'll find that uptake and translocation of that material within the plant is, is reduced and so we end up with uh, something interfering with the movement of that plant or getting bound up uh, very quickly within the plant before it can get to its uh, main target site. We also get the concept of hypersensitivity occurring where uh, the glyphosate uh, causes death in the, t the leaf tissues very quickly and within say a, a 12 to 24 hour period you have those those leaves becoming necrotic and it traps all the glyphosate within those leaves and doesn't allow it to move uh, through the rest of the plant and if you're applying beyond the point where the plant is a seedling that's really important and that tends to be an issue where they um, they have problems in uh, the U.S. Uh, corn belt where they tend to leave uh, application of glyphosate in the in corn crops uh, fairly late uh, in the process. Another concept that's come out of uh, some of uh, the glyphosate resistance uh, options that we've seen out there is something called vacuole sequestration. And so essentially what we find on the the outer membrane of the the cell, is that there's uh, what's called an ion pump that moves that glyphosate from the outside of the cell into the inside of the cell. In the resistant plant, what's happening is that plant copies that ion pump also onto the, the membrane of the vacuole, which is essentially the garbage can of the cell. And so as a result, um, that material is fast as it gets moved into the cell, it, it gets moved into the vacuole and, and uh, tucked away in a place where it can't be activated within the plant. Um, they think that maybe this process is linked to the, um, the phosphorus uh, management within the plant. And if that's the case, then we could have a major problem. Um, it could have a major problem in that uh, 
we would have both glyphosate and glufosinate uh, affected at the same time. If we look at how fast resistance uh, uh, increases in a, in a production system, is that let's assume that we've got a base population here of one plant in a million. And so the number in the center there where we've got uh, um, the percentage sign is essentially the equivalent of one plant in a million there. And so as you go through your applications and these, uh, this model is based on a sequential application and a mathematical model based on a sequential application where we've got a, a particular rate of increase of um, uh, seed production within that, that uh, weed. And so as we go through those, those applications, we find that we have uh, very good to excellent weed control up until a point where we find that we may have some unusual things happening in the field. And oftentimes the producer will look at that and think, well, that's a little bit odd, but we'll see what happens next year. Uh, and for, unfortunately, what happens next year is that he has a major weed control failure within that field. Um, essentially, the the further, the more zeros you add to that, uh, that initial base population number will essentially give you another year in uh, the development of that resistance within that plant. And again, this model doesn't take into account um, rotational uh, strategies or mixing strategies either um, that can essentially broaden out that, that time scale uh, fairly substantially. And a good example that I use uh, with producers to kind of get some perspective on this is if you've got a relatively modest population of about 40 plants per square meter of a weed in a field, uh, that essentially means you've got 24 million individuals over a quarter section. And so with this one in a million mutation rate, that also means that you could have 24 mutants within that field to initiate your resistance population. Um, you put that up to a higher uh, weed population within the field of say 400 plants per square meter. Again, you're just adding zeros to the equation and now you could have uh, 240 resistant plants within that quarter section. And so this is why we try and encourage producers to reduce the population of that weed as much as possible before you go into the field with herbicide in order to res uh, reduce your risk of developing resistance uh, down the road. And essentially, that's really what resistance is. It's an odds game. Um, and the the more you stack the odds against yourself, the um, uh, the more likely you are to get resistance uh, at the end. And this is uh, um, some information that, that comes from uh, some of our resistance experts around the countryside, whether that be Ian Heap out of Australia, whether it be uh, Charles Geddes, um, who uh, what will some of the slides that we'll be seeing here uh, in the future, uh, looking at what we would find in relative frequency within uh, specific uh, herbicide um, mutations or mutations that develop certain resistance, certain herbicides. Uh, with group twos, what you have there is a really high mutation rate that allows uh, a viable plant to persist within that population that also is resistant. And essentially what we found now is that it's not just the target site that the herbicide has to avoid, but there's essentially a big ring of proteins around that target site. And let's say the target site is down at the bottom here where my little pinky finger is. And in the, essentially the herbicide has to go through all of that, just like a lock or a key into a tumbler for a lock. And if any of those tumblers gets modified, then you've got resistance and that herbicide can't work anymore. So we've got a very, very high mutation rate for viability uh, within group twos. Group ones aren't very far behind at one in a million. Um, some of the other groups are one in 10 million. And we 
initially thought that resistance to a lot of these groups like group four and glyphosate uh, and multigenic systems was um, essentially impossible, uh, but essentially it's just a higher number. So you're getting in that one in a hundred million or one in a billion level uh, mutation rate. One of the challenges that we have right now is that we've got a really big machinery that likes to spread things really, really far. And so um, in order to manage our direct seeding systems, we want a nice uh, even spread of things coming out of the back of the combine and onto the field so that we can uh, run our seeding implements through there without any uh, any restrictions. And so that does a really good job of spreading weeds, not only across the span of that spread of that material, but also longitudinally as that uh, combine travels through the field. So you've got uh, a two dimensional spread of weeds across the surface. Um, Sorry about that, still got a little bit of a hangover cough from something I had back in mid-February. So if we look at uh, resistance patterns worldwide and the, the development of resistance uh, as time has gone on, we've, we essentially find that roughly about the, the early, the mid to late 80, no, mid to late 70s, uh, we begin to see resistance begin to increase in a fairly, um, rapid manner and regular manner, and essentially it's a linear um, linear increase in the number of weeds by herbicide group combination across the world. And so we see the same thing in Canada. We've got a fairly linear increase since uh, about the mid to late 70s uh, onward uh, through time and, and we're still seeing new cases of resistance develop uh, now in, in Canada. And uh, if we look at some of the resistance uh, work that uh, Charles Geddes is, is doing um, here just recently, uh, we're essentially seeing the same thing. And so we've got kind of this the linear type of um, uh, increase in the amount of resistance uh, in Saskatchewan. And so if we take that a little bit further, we can see that again, it's a linear pattern. And at this point here, at the rate of resistance that was seen in the last survey conducted in 2019 to 2020, we're looking at about 74% of fields that uh, weed was pulled from for testing uh, was found to be resistant. And essentially that ends up being roughly the same thing. Uh, so if we look at these little pie charts down here at the bottom, uh, the second pie chart is percentage of all fields. And so essentially we're looking at about 75% of all fields in Saskatchewan have some kind of case of herbicide resistance. And so we're looking at uh, on a field basis or like an area basis within the field uh, estimate, we're looking at about uh, uh, 15 million acres. And if we look at all those fields that are impacted by herbicide resistance, we're looking at somewhere in the neighborhood of 28 million acres. If we look at uh, glyphosate resistance increase throughout the world, um, again, it's very much on a linear basis since about the early 2000s. And what I've done here on this chart is I've essentially plotted all the cases of resistance and then I've added in all the names of the weeds that we have here on the prairies. And so you'll see a lot of familiar names there, prickly lettuce, Russian thistle, uh, annual bluegrass, uh, giant ragweed, uh, and downy brome. And so we've, uh, we have found downy brome resistance to glyphosate here just in the last couple of years. And our kosher discovery really wasn't that far behind uh, the first uh, discovery in the world. Um, and that essentially is a function of, of how we manage kosher. 
We also have a couple of weeds on our doorstep that uh, come pre-packed with glyphosate. Um, uh, Palmer amaranth and water hemp are a couple of uh, dioecious pigweeds. Um, and uh, that, that dioecious nature uh, means that they have a very diverse genetic makeup and are more inclined to uh, develop resistance uh, as a result of that, uh, that variability within the plant. And so uh, we've got uh, reports of water hemp that are um, in Manitoba right now. In uh, there's uh, uh, an RM that is right on the Saskatchewan border and roughly equidistant between Mooseman and uh, Yorkton, where we've uh, they found water hemp in that RM. And then we also have plenty of reports of. Uh, uh, water hemp on the uh, southern border uh, where Manitoba and Manitoba butt one another. Uh, we also have Palmer amaranth reported in the county that surrounds Minot in uh, North Dakota. And then we also have um, some uh, counties in the northwest of Montana that also have reported water hemp. And so again, these things come pre-packed with the uh, Multi multi group resistance typically, um, and so once they land here, there'll be a challenge to control right out of the gate. Um, it's similar to that uh, chart that we saw before. We'll look at uh, essentially what the the uh, resistance uh, study that Charles Geddes did here in nineteen. Uh, 2019-2020 and essentially look at uh, uh, what he found in that in that survey. So for, with wild oats, um, again, uh, three quarters of the samples that were collected showed resistance uh, to either group one or group two, and that was roughly about 50% of fields in the province. If we look at group two resistance in yeah, so that first one was group one, and that could be any one of the um, the subgroups within there, whether it be uh, DIM, DEN, uh, or FOP. And uh, with group twos, we're looking at uh, kind of a flattening out for some reason. We're not entirely sure why it, it did what it did here, um, but we've got uh, about 30% of the fields that were tested showed up with the resistance to a group two, and that was roughly about 18% of all fields. With the combined resistance, it follows very closely along with group two resistance, just because there's very high uh, resistance in group one. And so in this case, again, we have about 25% of fields that were tested showed uh, resistance to both group one and group two. And that was about 15% uh, 15, 15 of all fields. And so if we kind of plot what's going on here and what the trends could be by the next time we get into a her another herbicide resistance uh, survey that could likely take place in 24, 25. Uh, if we look at the, the FOPs in that group, uh, which is in the blue uh, and the group ones, um, we could probably see about 70% uh, of uh, fields just with uh, group ones in it. And we could have also 30% um, of fields with uh, group two and about the same amount with uh, combined. We don't know what resistance level we have to group eights because uh, group eight resistance wasn't really tested. Um, in the last two surveys and so that would be really good to get a, a bit of a uh, a benchmark on what's going on with that as well and and maybe increased use of of those two um, uh, herbicide uh, families is is kind of taking away from some of the group two use a little bit and uh, helping out with that uh, the increase in group two resistance um, recently what happened is that trilate got moved from group 8 into group 15 and then there's also another uh, 
chemical family that's uh, essentially the one active ingredient that we have here that gets used frequently is uh, peroxisulfone. And so that would be the what we would have thought of as a true group 15 uh, earlier on. So just an example of what could happen uh, it, with the development of uh, group one and group two resistant um, uh, uh, wild oats, let's say uh, for wheat production, if we get combined group one and group two resistance, then essentially uh, these are all the products that we have left. And if we kind of note the prices that run in the those those group one, group two areas, that run in the neighborhood of uh, maybe 10 to $15 uh, an acre. Uh, if we have to convert to some of the soil applied, which the group eights and group 15s are, um, then we're probably looking at an increase into the 25 to $32 an acre range. So we're looking at a significant increase in, in the cost of managing wild oats just with uh, the loss of those two groups. And we again, we don't know what the what the status is right now of of trilate and whether uh, whether it's resistant or not, uh, and what level of resistance we have to that. We know that we do have cases of resistance to that, um, and we don't know how much um, crossover there is between trilate and peroxisulfone uh, with the resistance. There has been. Uh, work done in in Manitoba that's also found uh, resistance to peroxisulfone. Uh, for green foxtail, about 28% of samples that were collected uh, were shown to be resistant to group one, and there's a fairly low percentage, less than 10% of fields that are affected. Uh, redroot pigweed, um, we've we've seen a fairly significant increase in that, uh, where 50%, of, almost 60% of samples that were collected were found to be resistant, but um, a very low number of fields were impacted in this case. Uh, uh, very similar with false cleavers, uh, we're seeing that going up on a fairly regular basis. 42% um, of samples that were collected were shown to be resistant to group twos, but again, a very low number or percentage of fields were uh, potentially impacted there. And wherever we see that low number of fields impacted, we're probably looking at the absence is likely a result of using the herbicide. Uh, Shepherd's Purse, uh, continuing its upward uh, increase in resistance. It was only found for the first time in the last uh, weed survey. Uh, and so uh, resistance weed survey. And so about almost 50% of samples are uh, shown to be resistant of the ones that were collected. Again, a low number of fields. So we're, we're still seeing that kind of branch out a little bit. Uh, wild mustard. 50% of fields were found to, or collections were found to be resistant and it spread over about 3% of fields. And where it was found, it consumed a lot of that field. So we're looking at about 70% of that field. Pale smartweed, again, roughly 50%, low number of fields, uh, about a, a quarter of the area, field area occupied in that case. Uh, stinkweed, uh, surprisingly a fairly low number, uh, about 15%, a low number of fields, but where you find it, you find lots of it. So you're looking at almost 70% of the area of those fields that had resistance were occupied by stinkweed. And chickweed, similar, uh, found for the first time last year or last survey and has is continuing sort of a linear upward trend. So we're almost to, to 50% now, but again, a low number of fields. Uh, hemp nettle, uh, continuing on a fairly upward uh, path, uh, about 60% of uh, samples tested positive, but again, at a low number of fields. 
and lamb's quarters were finding for the first time it showed up in the resistance survey uh very low uh it, essentially one field was found and so um it's low on all the scales that are uh, reported in the pie charts the other thing that uh, Charles has done recently in conjunction with Sean Sharp uh, at Ag Canada in Saskatoon um, is look at uh, kochia resistance. And so essentially what we've got uh, reported in the last survey that took place in 2019 is that 87% of samples that were tested were found to be glyphosate resistant. And um, what we can do though is look at the colors of the dots that are occurring on the map essentially where you have very dark blue dots on there you've got very well established glyphosate resistance but if you look into some of the pale dots these are um, still sort of sorting out their genetics and so you may have plenty of live plants uh, next to dead plants in those fields where some of the population was controlled and some of the population wasn't. Also looked at was uh, dicamba resistance. And so again, we've got lots of dots on there, but we've got lots of dots at uh, a very low level. Uh, there are a few fields in there that are showing uh, a moderate level resistance, but overall we're looking at about 45% of uh, kochia collected in that survey was found to be resistant. And Charles has also done surveys in Alberta where they've also found uh, phylloxypur resistant. And one of the things that they have found there that is kind of interesting is the that the crossover between phylloxypur and dicamba is not really particularly high. Uh, I don't think we quite understand what the mechanism behind that is yet, uh, but Charles is working on that to, to find out what it is. And so we're looking at roughly 44% of samples in Alberta were resistant to fluoroxypur, about 28% um, of dicamba uh, were resistant to dicamba, and about 14% crossed over in between. Um, so that's um, a bit of a departure from what we've normally seen with uh, resistance and uh, cross resistance within groups. Um, Charles has also found the first case of uh, glyphosate resistant downy brome in southern Alberta. And so we're looking at uh, a plant that is about 10 times resistant. Uh, and you can see the plants in the back row there that uh, survived the higher rates of glyphosate. And that would be the normal rate of glyphosate there, about half to one, sort of what we would refer in the old days to is about half to one, um, one liter per, per acre, uh, or 180 to 360 grams per acre. Uh, the other thing that is is really kind of made us stand up and have a have a look is uh, the case of group 14 resistance that was found around the Rosetown area here uh, just recently. And so uh, that um, sample is testing at very, very high levels, which would suggest that it is a single gene mutation. Uh, that's taking place in there, but there still needs to be some more work in there to confirm that and to look at uh, crossover to other subgroups within group 14. Uh, that's the normal rate there. And so we're looking at about 16 times uh, resistant at least uh, because that plant is still doing reasonably well there on the right hand side. So how are producers dealing with herbicide resistant weeds? Um, when when we uh, do uh, questionnaires with, with uh, producers and we ask them what they're doing, essentially what they're saying is that they're dealing with it with herbicides. And uh, the one that stands out at the top there is crop rotation. 
but I have a suspicion that when they say crop rotation, it's so that they can use different herbicides. And unfortunately, the solution to this problem is not going to come from a jug. And so I think that producers are going to have to make a fairly foundational uh, change in the way that they farm in order to get on top of this problem before they have a complete loss of um, the herbicides that they've become used to using. And so we've got producers stuck on the, the herbicide treadmill. And so like, what, did we, what do we do and how can we handle that? So the harsh reality is that there's only a finite number of pathways that herbicides can work on. Um, the oftentimes we hear that, oh, well, the, the herbicide manufacturers are waiting till everything else is gone and then they're going to pop this new thing on us and, and charge us through the nose for it. Um, they're still doing lots of discovery work on uh, new herbicides and some of them have made fairly substantial investments in uh ai programs and and um different uh methodologies in the way that they look for uh those target sites to attack uh all the easy ones have been found and so um essentially they've really haven't found a whole lot since 2010 we do have this one on the far right hand side with a question mark on it but that one has been developed for use in rice so we don't grow much rice here. So that one's not going to be that much good to us. So we have to kind of figure out how to use what we've got and, and hang on to what we have. Uh, we've got the uh, three way uh, resistance in glyphosate and pretty soon it could be four way. Um, so once a weed is resistant, uh, they're there is really no going back on that. Um, uh, there, there was some suggestion at uh, when in the old atrazine days where uh, at the early start of that curve for Canada where they, they found that there was, um, there was a penalty for, for having herbicide resistance, uh, but that, uh, that fitness penalty does not really um, come to the front in in many cases of, of herbicide resistance. By and large, most of them are as fit as uh, the uh, wild type was. And so there's no reversing those. And even in cases where let's say we do have um, some fitness penalty as a result of having resistance, uh, you would probably have to leave that area idle for a uh, hundred years or so to even see any shift in that population back to a susceptible population. And really, if we get right down to it, we could manage um, weeds down to a fairly low level of resistance and and do quite well in, in that. Um, most people can't even see it in the field when it's uh, below about 20%. Um, it looks like normal escapes within the field. And so if we were to be able to maintain that at a fairly low level, uh, then we would probably do quite well at managing it. So some of the things that we can look at to try and manage it, rotation is one. Uh, we want to look at four years or more in that rotation and very diverse, um, not something that's just bouncing back between back and forth between broadleaf uh, crops. We'd have to have both grass and broadleaf crops in that rotation. And every once in a while we should throw a perennial uh, forage in there and take it off for hay and that will bring down uh, the seed bank very dramatically. And if we look at um, some studies that were done back in the mid 90s uh, where they essentially had a uh, fields that had been in wheat production for the last three years versus a field that was coming out of um, an alfalfa or, or alfalfa grass uh, hay rotation, uh, we can see that for many of these weeds like wild oats, uh, cleavers, we have a fairly substantial drop in the in the, the seed bank, 
even Canada thistle uh, drops by a fairly significant amount. Um, the challenge here with wild mustard is that it's got a very long um, lifespan in the seed in the soil seed bank. And so as a result, it's going to take longer to draw that seed bank down uh, to a level where it is um, essentially the equivalent of a herbicide. Uh, the only the, the downside of that is that you get an increase in dandelion. Um, I would probably take that uh, as a uh, as a little bit of a penalty for for drawing down that seed bank. Uh, some of our more problem weeds like kosher and Russian thistle have a very, very short seed life in the soil. We're looking at three years until you're down below like 1%, and then you may get the odd survivor uh, being retained in that soil for maybe out as long as five or six years. But generally, the population gets drawn down very quickly, and then as oftentimes replenished by um, plants rolling across the landscape more so than coming back from seeds that were already in the soil. And a lot of people have highly overestimate the, the seed life of uh, wild oats in the soil. If you leave those wild oats sitting on the soil surface, they, they actually disappear quite quickly. It's when we incorporate them into the soil, that's when uh, we start seeing a little bit longer persistence uh, showing up. But again, most of them are gone by about year seven. And the other option is pushing them down very deeply. And, th and the way you would do that would be with something like uh, a moldboard plow uh, to flip everything over and then just flatten it out and farm everything, low disturbance on top of that. Um, so those are a couple of different uh, management strategies for dealing with something like wild oat. Um, just general cropping practices. Um, we were so intent on trying to pinch every last penny out of uh, out of the crop is is that we're not making we're not taking that that extra that we would have spent as an investment in weed control. And so the ways that we can improve that is that we want to, our main goal is to have a, a healthy, very competitive crop. And we want to be able to vary our seeding dates, increase our seeding rate, decrease our row spacing. And, and a lot of these have been foregone because of um, it, it's easy engineering solution to some of our direct seeding systems. Uh, if we look at uh, some work that was done on barley uh, seeding rate and its response in uh, wild oat seed weight, uh, we can see that if we just push our, our rate to the right here a little bit, if it goes, no, it didn't go. So if we were to take, just move that bar over to the right by one bar width essentially you have uh, increased potential for yield and a decreased uh, um, seed weight uh, in the in the sample this is a picture from back in the the pre um, herbicide tolerant canola days where we had a, a relatively low uh, seeding rate over here, I think it was in the neighborhood of one and a half to two pounds. And neither of these two plots have uh, herbicides on them in the canola picture. Uh, whereas the canola on the left uh, was seeded at a narrow row spacing, so eight inch row spacing, uh, but also at, um, at about five, I think it would have been about five pounds in the old West R days. Even relatively uh, uncompetitive crops, we can get a response to seeding rate. And so in this case, uh, Steve Shirtliff did some work with his grad students on uh, moving that seeding rate up a bit. And what they find is that they get increased yield and biomass out of that movement to the, the right hand side of the chart. And they also get a decrease in, in weed biomass uh, as a result as well. 
uh, we did some work on um, uh, what what's the impact of row spacing versus seating rate um, in partnership with uh, uh, the Indian Head uh, IHARF station out there uh, at Indian Head. And we also did that uh, at some additional sites uh, in our agar arm network. And uh, what we what we have there uh, at Indian Head is this neat seeder that if you pull some pins and you you crank some cables, you can change your your uh, drill width and your row spacing um, to get anywhere from 10 to 16 inches for row spacing. Uh, at the other sites, what we did is we just uh, encouraged the the other sites to block every other run in order to get a wide row spacing from uh, versus the the seeders that they're already using and we got uh, very similar results from uh, all the sites so essentially what we what we have here is that um, uh, if we kind of look at this chart from a statistical point of view uh, any of these numbers here that are less than 0 0.05 uh, would be considered to be significant. And so in this case here for the row spacing and early season weed biomass, while the individual points themselves are not significantly different, there is a significant trend uh, occurring here to uh, reduced weed biomass at at increased or lower row spacings or narrower row spacings. But in this case, we're not seeing that same impact with just seeding rate. So we're getting a reduce in biomass from the, the seed row adjustment, but we're not getting a, um, a, a response to the seeding rate. For a, a one to nine visuals uh, weed rating, uh, what we found is that all of them uh, uh, all the sites for row spacing were significant and uh, the trend towards a linear response was significant. Um, we also found in this case that seeding rate uh, also showed a significant response uh, in all, all aspects. So the points themselves, uh, a linear response and a quadrilateral lateral response. Quadratic. That's the one. Um, this is a bit of an interesting uh, uh, chart where we kind of break out the different row spacings and, and uh, run seeding rate uh, along the curves. And essentially what we're seeing here with wheat head density is that if we've got uh, this wider row spacing with the X's and the more sort of burgundy colored line, we're finding that if we try and increase our seeding rate along that, line uh, we don't get very much response but if we narrow up our rows uh, to those the narrowest row spacing that we have on that machine when we increase our seating rates we tend to get a response to that and generally we get a higher number of, of wheat heads in response to increases in seating rate when we have narrow rows So we also see by narrowing up the rows and increasing the seeding rate, we also see a, a positive response to maturity. Uh, we also see an increased ability. This is essentially the reverse of dockage. So we also see less dockage in uh, the narrow rows and higher seeding rates. And we also see an improvement in crop yield when we go to the narrow rows but we're not seeing that same response when we just uh, go for seeding rate. And as far as test weight goes, we're seeing a positive response for both in that case. Uh, so narrower rows, higher test weight, higher seeding rate, higher test weight. And this is, uh, this is what uh, some of those look like. Uh, we did this sort of, um, this was a, a field day from the year before we did the work uh, uh, from a more scientific level. Uh, and what we did in this case is we uh, seeded uh, tame mustard as a model weed underneath the 
uh, the wheat. Uh, and uh, we can see that we're getting, with that higher seeding rate and even a 12 inch row, we're getting a pretty good response. There's no herbicides applied to this, uh, this trial. And so we're getting pretty clean uh, a plot here without the, the need to use a herbicide. Whereas if we've got uh, lower seeding rates and uh, broader, wider seeding rows, uh, we end up having to have a, a herbicide in the system in order to manage our weeds. Harvest weed seed management is another new tool that producers have available to them. And essentially, it's just taking the chaff that comes off the back of the combine and doing something with it so that it uh, it doesn't return seeds to the, the, the soil seed bank. And so one of the um, management strategies here, initially in Australia, they just had little tin pieces they would put in the back of the combine and then it would drop that chaff right in the center of the combine, but then they, they would get uh, build up of chaff in that one spot and they'd have to end up burning it all the time. So what they ended up doing is dropping that chaff into the wheel tracks of the combine and then the way they would also run all of their equipment uh, and control traffic farming method um, along those wheel tracks as well. And so what they found there is that uh, although they're sacrificing the, the rows there for the wheel tracks and for control traffic farming, um, what they're doing is they're running over that, uh, those weeds, seeds and chaff that are laid out in that, that string along the wheel tracks. And they're finding that uh, they're getting very little germinating out of there just because you're getting more rot, you're getting more um, uh, susceptibility to uh, small rodents and birds feeding on the seeds um, and essentially uh, some of these producers that adopted this system have found that they only need to spray the wheel tracks really um, all that material that's been gathered off the cutter bar and gone through the combine has all been controlled and then they're left with what's going on in the in the wheel tracks and this one here is, this is a commercial one that's, um, oh, what is this one called? Um, there's, uh, we've seen that at some of the field days um, in Saskatchewan here. Um, EMAR, this is an EMAR chaff deck is what this is. And um, I forget who, uh, who had that on display. This one here is a home built one for a producer. Uh, he just built it so that he had a belt in here that was run hydraulically off the combine. And so he could put that in whatever wheel track he wanted. Um, and so it reduced the number of wheel tracks that he had to worry about. Uh, some of the newer technology and uh, this technology might be better adapted uh, for Saskatchewan is the use of uh, cage mills uh, that uh, this is sort of the original Harrington uh, weed destructor that is um, being pulled behind the combine here and uh, it originally had like 150 horse diesel motor on here but what would happen is that they pull the chaff off the the sieves run it into this thing, mill it up and shoot it out the back. And then uh, the straw would follow its own pathway through the machine as well. And essentially, if you look on the left uh, schematic there, uh, what we find is that you essentially have a plenum that goes up into the back end of the combine in order to separate the chaff from the straw. And by doing that, you can direct that, that chaff into a mill, which is on the right hand side here. And so the the top unit is a stator here where you've got bars on the stator and then the chaff comes down through a hole. There's paddles in the middle here that are on the rotor uh, that is powered from the other side. And this thing turns at about 3000 RPM and flings all that chaff out through those those uh, bars or whatever obstructions they've got there and uh, causes uh, both. Uh, essentially the anything that goes through there about 95 to 98 percent control uh, takes place. 
These are the ones that are uh, the, the uh, integrated models, um, the original integrated model from Harrington Seed Destructor on the left there was run by hydraulics. And so they had to have a separate hydraulic cooling system uh, on that in order to uh, uh, manage the extra heat and extra draw that they were getting out of that, uh, that system. Whereas their competitor, the seed terminator, used a belt right off of the uh, straw chopper uh, belt uh, or pulley and uh, utilized the power off of that. And both of them ran horizontal mills um, in that system. Uh, the Harrington Seed Destructor has since changed the, their design. And essentially what they've got here now, they've got a, essentially a blank cabinet here in the middle, uh, which is to collect um, unmillable uh, articles there in that middle bit. They flip their uh, mills up on their sides and now they are also running uh, via belt off of the uh, straw topper system. And what's inside these things is essentially for the Harrington Seed Destructor, they have bars on the stator, bars on the rotor, and paddles on the inside to drive everything outward. Uh, Seed Terminator took a little bit of a different uh, pathway in that on their uh, rotor, they still had bars in that system, but their stator, they had kind of a webbing uh, that was in there, like a heavy, heavy steel mesh that was uh, built in there. Uh, the original designs they found they weren't quite sturdy enough and so you can see all the wear on these things. Um, they run a lot of sand through combines there in, in Australia. Uh, what they've done is they've beefed up uh, that uh, mesh a little bit, opened up the holes a little bit and beefed up the mesh that they make it out of now and those seem to be doing much better than the original uh, design was. We also have a home built model here on the left hand side called Redicop C control unit and uh, pros and it's roughly the same layout as the original um, Harrington C destructor uh, with bars on bars as far as impact sites. Um, it is integrated into their MAV straw chopper. And so both of those can be moved on a rail together to get them out of the way. Um, and then this other design is uh, from a tech farm weed hog out of Australia as well. And uh, the real difference between this one and the other three is that the other three are roughly in that $75,000 American range. Um, and they draw about uh, 50, 50 to 70 horsepower off of the um, the uh, combine power unit. So those ones you have to have a class seven or above combine in order to operate them. Whereas this tech hog on the other side, what they're trying to do is make better use of airflow through these systems here uh, and, and try and reduce the power draw. Uh, they did do that, they're down in that sort of 30 to 50 range and their cost on their unit is a lot lower so they're in that that uh, 50,000 American range. Um, downside is that they only get about 80 percent uh, weed kill off of the uh, the back of the the tech tech farm weed hog whereas these other ones here are 95 to 98 percent and across all three uh, uh, brands. So on the inside you can see that uh, with the Redicop C control unit you've got roughly the same design as the, the original uh, Harrington C destructor. It's got horizontal um, uh, rotors in it that are um, driven by the belt as well. Um, with the tech car they've got a, a um, a bit of a unique design here in the sense that it's um, they're they're essentially throwing with with these bars here they're throwing things up against these bars that are essentially operating in different directions but they're trying to manage airflow through this system to try and reduce energy requirements 
So what uh, what happens when uh, weeds go through this system? Uh, on the left there, you can see uh, um, some chaff that's been seeded with uh, uh, volunteer canola seed, um, and that's the, the before going through the seed destructors. And then once that material goes through the, the seed destructor, you see it's pretty much ground to a powder there on the bottom. And then when those are seeded out, you get next to nothing uh, uh, emerging in that system. You get little sticks showing up, but that's about it. Some of the challenges that we're going to have with uh, integrated weed management is that that I can kind of see on the horizon is um, I don't know that if, if that our nitrification inhibitors and our our, our um, uh, technology that we've got to uh, manage um, the movement of of nitrogen back into the atmosphere from our our fertilizer has necessarily done us any favors because it it has kind of allowed us to rely on broadcasting more than we used to. And if we look at regardless of uh, the the technology and that that nitrification inhibitor system uh, side banding still results in less weed biomass than if you broadcast. So essentially, if you're broadcasting, you're feeding all your weeds rather than your crop. And so you end up with more vigorous weeds to try and manage. Um, a little while back when we were in our wet phase there, we had really heavy promotion of the high speed tillage implements. And so that really had had a, a more of an uptake on um, tillage and and disruption of that. That's that that no till system has really kind of helped us out as far as uh, keeping weed numbers lower than they would normally be. And so when we reintroduce tillage, we're reintroducing weeds back into the soil seed bank and into more a more dormant state than um, we wouldn't see them in, in direct seeding. Um, so uh, integrated solutions uh, need short and long-term goals. Uh, the key to minimizing the risk of resistance is to reduce that weed density before we get into the field with the herbicide. And by doing that, you reduce your odds of finding that resistant individual. Um, we've got some cultural methods that are just as good at, or in some cases better than herbicides. And when we look at something like the, those weed destructors, um, if we pencil out uh, some of the, the economics of those things, they're cheaper than the soil active herbicides. And so um, I think those are a viable option for the future as long as producers start to adopt them and, uh, and start using them out there in their fields. And really at the end of the day, producers need to make a fundamental change in the way that they're farming if we're going to uh, stave off resistance. So they can they can make that fund fundamental change now when they've got uh, a full uh, spade of herbicides to be able to rely on as backups, or they can wait until they've exhausted all those herbicide options and then they're totally dependent on these, these uh, non-herbicide options in order to manage their weeds. Um, one of the things that uh, has happened um, in the past is that uh, places like in Europe, uh, they've got a weed there called blackgrass, and essentially they've waited there until uh, their herbicides are right on the edge of, of being able to manage that thing. And a lot of them are putting down six active ingredients in six different groups uh, at about $120 an acre in order to uh, just suppress that weed enough that they can get a crop off of it. So that's what I had for today. Um, uh, thank you very much and I'll uh, take some of the questions now. Yes, uh, thank you very much Clark. That was actually a really great uh, presentation. Really enjoyed that. Um, so I invite everyone if you have any questions, uh, just please type them into the chat box or raise your